Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be going over passage 10 in the BB section of the AAMC sample test. And yes, it is the last passage. Let's jump right into it. The passage starts out, Sugar toxin STX producing bacteria cause over 1 million deaths a year, but treatment with antibiotics is not effective and no definitive medical treatment is currently available. That sucks. The sugar toxin protein is composed of two subunits, an alpha helical 293 amino acid subunit A and a pentamer of 69 amino acid B subunits. Okay, so here we got some basic sciences. We got subunits. We got quaternary structure. I'm going to put STX and then sub A and sub B. I don't know if this is going to come in handy, but it might. Subunit B mediates retrograde trafficking from the cell surface to the endoplasmic reticulum, after which subunit A is cleaved into the catalytic A1 domain that functions by depurinating a specific position on the ribosome. This halts protein synthesis. Okay, I'm going to write a little note. This mediates, what was it? Retrograde trafficking. Subunit A gets cleaved into A1, which helps halt protein synthesis. Moving on, the C terminal A2 domain, so we do have an A2, remains associated with subunit B. So I'll just kind of put a little arrow in between them. It was thought that GPP-130, a host membrane protein, okay, so now we're talking about the host protein. These were all with the uh, sugar toxin and with the bacteria. But now we're talking about host. A host membrane protein that cycles between the Golgi apparatus and endosomes might assist sugar toxin in evading degradation and reaching the endoplasmic reticulum as it binds the toxin with a KD of 25 millimolar. So KD is a dissociation constant. We should know um, a little bit about that. Prior research showed that exposure to manganese degrades GPP-130. Interesting. So I'm going to write down GPP-130 bind sugar toxin and i'm gonna put a little frowny face by gpp 130 because it kind of sounds like it is um helping out the bacteria and we don't want that and that's a bad thing for health so i'm gonna put a frowny face by it in order to investigate whether gpp 130 is involved in the movement of sugar toxin from endosomes into the golgi apparatus researchers constructed sugar toxin b which contains a fluorescently tagged subunit b they measured the percent of cellular sugar toxin B in the Golgi and cultured human cells and repeated the experiment for fluorescently tagged cholera toxin, which follows the same route as sugar toxin to the Golgi but does not require GPP-130. Okay, I'm a little bit confused. I'm just going to go into the figure. Graph of percentage of sugar toxin and cholera toxin in Golgi with and without manganese. Okay, so they're, they're adding in manganese, which would... Uh, degrade the GPP-130 and still seeing if the sugar toxin could, I, I got it, I got it. So let's do a little bit of figure interpretation. We see the key up here with the control and the manganese. So the dotted line is with the manganese. What would we expect? Ask yourself that before you really get into these figures. What do you expect? If the hypothesis is correct, when we add in manganese, so I'm going to put you know, add in manganese, we should see a decrease in the GPP-130 effect, at least. And so we should see a decrease of the sugar toxin being able to do anything. That's if the hypothesis is correct. Let's see if that's what we see. So we got Golgi sugar toxin um, over time. It looks like the control follows kind of this pattern. And looky there, when you add manganese, it definitely decreases the amount of sugar toxin that we end up seeing uh, in the Golgi. And so it looks like the hypothesis is correct. And we see that it's not just the manganese that's causing some weird result. The manganese actually does have a specific purpose with the GPP-130 and the sugar toxin because in this kind of control um, with the cholera toxin, we don't see manganese doing anything. So that's good. All right. So we got a good bit of flow charting on this one. That's, that's good. 52. By allowing shiga toxin to move from the early endosome to the Golgi, subunit B permits the toxin to bypass which organelle? So I'm going back up here to the passage to where it first mentions subunit B, and it says that it mediates retrograde trafficking from the cell surface to the ER, uh, yada, yada, yada. So basically, if we have a cell and we have a, an endosome that has kind of got this shiga toxin within it, that's the worst drawing ever, sorry. It's basically saying if that endosome is able to get to the Golgi, what is happening? It's got to bypass something. It's got to get 
past something in order to be able to really cause this effect on cells that it obviously causes. Is it bypassing the centriole? No, when I think of centrioles, I think of like mitosis and the spindle fibers. And that's kind of what I think of the centriole as. I don't think it would have anything to do with an endosome coming into the cell, really. A plastid. So I think plastids, I think plant cells and chloroplasts and that kind of stuff. So I don't think that that's correct either because we are talking about animal cells. In fact, I think we're talking about humans specifically. I mentioned deaths earlier. I don't think we're talking about like animal or plant deaths. We could be, I guess, but I don't think it's going to be plastids. The nucleolus. So I don't think that any endosome would immediately be going to the in, the nucleolus um, before it goes to the Golgi. So I don't think that this uh, subunit B is bypassing the nucleolus in any sort of way. A lysosome, however, that would be responsible for uh, degrading anything that comes into the cell that isn't supposed to be there. And so I think that that would be a reasonable assumption for us to make that the subunit B helps it uh, bypass the lysosome, which helps it kind of integrate itself into the cell and, and avoids degradation. 53, the most likely result of various alanine to proline mutations in subunit A is... So if I'm remembering correctly in the passage, we weren't told that these um, these mutations actually happen, but I think that the question is basically asking, do you know the difference between alanine and proline and kind of how they play into the structure of a protein? A says a lack of retrograde trafficking. So um, that was subunit B. If you go back up in the passage, you can see that that was subunit B that helps with the retrograde trafficking. Um, and here we're talking about subunit A. So I don't think that that would be the right answer. B says increased hydrogen bonding. I typically don't think of proline as a strong hydrogen bonder. In fact, the, the, the mere fact that the backbone amino group is actually going to lose a hydrogen when it when proline kind of does a backflip and connects its side chain to that nitrogen, it's probably going to decrease hydrogen bonding, if anything. So I don't think that's going to be the case either. C says loss of secondary structure. So for sure, you know, proline's the kinky amino acid or whatever, it adds kinks into the structure of your protein. And so you are probably going to have, if you have various, uh, you're probably going to have a pretty big um, effect on your secondary structure. Um, as a result of these proline mutations. Secondary structure specifically kind of goes with the alpha helices and the, the beta sheets. And uh, as we know, alpha helices are really uh, mucked up by proline. So that's probably going to be our answer. D says higher catalytic activity. I don't think we have any evidence to say that proline is going to help with the catalytic activity. I mean, could proline help with the depurinating a specific position on the ribosome, I have no freaking clue, but I don't have any specific evidence that tells me that it does. But I do know from my basic sciences that proline is going to muck up the secondary structure. So I'm going to pick that one. 54 says several strains of sugar toxin producing E. coli are responsible for disease. Despite the availability of antibiotics that lice E. coli cells, the reason this is not a recommended course of treatment is because this is going to be one of those logic and reasoning. I probably, after reading this, I like to think about what I want the answer to be. But in this case, I have no clue. Like, just give me some answer choices and I'm going to pick the most logical one. A says GPP-130 is also a target of several common antibiotics. So remember that GPP-130 was a host protein, and so probably not going to be the target of antibiotics, which typically go for bacteria. B says the bacterial lysate will disrupt host translation. So I'm assuming lysate means whatever comes out when you lyse a cell or basically like bust a cell. So if these E. coli cells are chock full of shiga toxin and we bust them open, I'm imagining that the shiga toxin is probably going to uh, hurt the cells that it's going into. I think that's the point. So I like that one. C says shiga toxin confers antibiotic resistance once inside the host cell. Huh? I don't really know what that means. And um, it's also not mentioned in the passage. So I don't, I'm not loving that answer. That feels like a cop out if I didn't like any of the other answers, but I don't like it. D, antibiotics are not effective against viruses. So we're not talking about viruses. Sugar toxin is not a virus. Um, e. coli is bacteria, so not a virus. So I think B is going to be our best answer here. 55 says a novel compound was developed with 
which occupies the site on sugar toxin where GPP-130 binds to toxin. A drug with which value of KD for binding to sugar toxin is most effective? So we were told that the GPP-130 binds to the sugar toxin with a KD of 25 millimolar, I believe it was. So we definitely want something that binds a lot better than the GPP-130, right? That, that makes logical sense. This question I really think is asking, do you know uh, what a small versus a large KD would indicate? So in this case, you should know that as KD gets smaller, that means that the binding is actually going up. If you think about it, you can you can think about KD as how much dissociation is happening. So if it's a higher number, that would mean more dissociating. And we want it to be stuck together really well. So we want a low KD. So in this case, you just pick the lowest one, and that's that. 56 says, which type of enzyme is responsible for activating subunit A? So our first question to ourselves should be, how is subunit A activated? If we go back up into the passage, we can see that it's cleaved. Subunit A is a protein and it's getting cleaved and that's what activates it. So now our question is simplified down to what type of enzyme cleaves proteins? That would be a protease. All right, that's the end of that passage. I hope that I helped some. If you guys have any questions or you want to let us know what you want to see in the future, please leave a comment down below and also hit like and subscribe if you like free MCAT prep. I will see you in the next video.